all right so here we go so i will start in a very simple way, manner this course is a fairly technical course fairly hands-on so but but uh, we will make sure that we learn in the right manner by practicing a lot on cloudx lab all right so a little bit about no big data so no big data basically started with a with the mindset that we, we will have a great set of instructors and for that matter we have great set of instructors and then we we built something called cloudx lab which other companies have also started uh taking from us and i'm very happy to build this cloudx lab and as of today if the candidate is not learning on a real cluster on a real cluster they are not actually learning the technologies okay so the virtual machine and other things did not suffice that's why we built our own cluster on the real technology the way it used to happen in my past experience in the real world all right so this is the best place for learning the real technology rather than learning only the theory okay so the other thing which we have is lifetime access to learning management system there is no limitation we have all the slides class recordings assignments and quizzes project work everything in lms now the project which we are going to give is going to be a real life based project it's not going to be a real life meaning it's not going to be with a company per se we only give the projects with the real customer only if you prove yourself in this course well okay so if you prove yourself in the course then we will keep keep you in mind when we are starting a project with one customer and only then you get to you get to work with the real customer because commitment as well as ability to deliver is a big concern when it comes to the real life project okay so we provide you a course completion certificate with 24 by 7 support and uh, we have something called no big data alumni where we keep on sending you all the we keep you stay connected with the latest jobs and stay updated with the course quizzes and complimentary sessions and all right so that this is about no big data all right this is me myself uh, i'm sandeep giri i did my graduation in 2002 from it roorkee and then i worked at a place called de shaw the people from us must be knowing de shaw it used to be one of the largest hedge fund and most technical company before google's all right afterwards i built a company called tbits global we uh, so it's a document management system for large enterprises okay so it's again into data management technologies afterwards i worked with inmobi where i churned around 200 terabytes of data and and built a recommender okay then i joined a company called amazon where i worked on building high throughput stream processing systems okay for and the, the first use case of my stream processing was to optimize the image or to do the selection and optimization of the product image which is shown on amazon's detail page and then in 2014 may i planned to quit amazon and started no big data now we're going to complete around two years and we are very glad to see our overall performance for two years all right so this is about me all right so let's start our discussion the first question that you will face is what exactly is big data so apart from the typical definition we will stick to our our subset of problems that we will discuss across the course okay so our definition of big data is it's simply a data of very big size that you cannot process using usual tools and to process such kind of data or to solve such kind of problems you end up with a distributed computing either your own own system or any third party system so whenever whenever you need a distributed architecture by virtue of 
use volume size or the rate at which you are getting the data we call the problem as big data problem or we call the data as big data the data could be structured or unstructured all right so here we will first like to define what do we mean by structure semi structured and unstructured so when we know about what is there what are the fields in the input data when we clearly know that in the input data we have these many fields and these are the data types of these fields then we call the data as structured data because we know the complete structure of the data we know what are the fields as well as we know their data types all right the second is semi structured data okay so examples of structured data is the data in database in database when you create a table you define the column data types okay and you define the number of columns so in a, in a database table we clearly know what are the fields and what are the data types in case of semi structured data we clearly know what are the fields would we know the names of the fields we know the separation between the fields but we do not know what are the data types of each in involved field for example when you get a csv file you get comma separated values which are not really saying anything about the data types okay so in case of a csv you have to infer their data types and then you have to convert it from the string into the individual data type whether it's number boolean or date or whatever so this is semi structured and the third one is unstructured data type the data in which you do not know up front that what are the fields and knowing the data types of the fields is out of question in this case so when you do not know the data types of the fields then we call it unstructured we do not know what are the fields in the input file it, it may be a plain text file it may be a binary object it may be anything okay so in those cases we call this data as unstructured so most of the problems involved with unstructured data are to convert this unstructured data to either semi structured or structured form all right and such problems are also very frequent when it comes to the big data all right so we talked about few things on this slide one data of very big size second can't process with usual tools so what do we mean by usual tools usual tools again are non distributed in nature and third one we talked about fourth one we talked about structured or unstructured data so out of these if you look at these four points closely the most important one is the distributed architecture needed so what do we mean by distributed architecture or distributed computing in in a in a formal sense it means groups of networked computers interacting with each other to achieve a common goal okay so this is distributed computing you have it's not the network alone you are dividing the work that needs to be done amongst these computers okay and you will be amazed at the amount of efficiency that you can get out of dividing the work among so many computers all right so let's go to the classic definition of big data all right so apart from our definition saying it's a distributed computing i would like to understand explain to you what are the characteristics of the data which makes it big data so the first and most important characteristic of data is the volume of the data the data could be such that it's in huge size so the objective with such data is you have to store it somewhere okay and when the storage becomes the problem then you say that by virtue of the volume of my data i will have to move to distributed computing and therefore 
my big data is because of volume okay so the data at rest could be uh, could be you can see the example such as the storage of the data by gmail storage of data by uh, uh, in the form of logs and in case of facebook there is 300 petabyte of data where they are generating a lot of data per day okay so where do they store it how can they store such kind of data we will go into this de detailed discussion into how to build such a system which can store any amount of data as we go forward then the second characteristic which might make a data make data as big data is velocity velocity could be is best explained as data in motion okay so data in motion what does it mean let's say right now right now when i'm delivering the session every byte is being transferred to more than 50 atten attendant there are more than 50 attendees right now and this kind of velocity of the data has to reach to every student on time okay so this this kind of rapid speed that is required needs kind of distributed systems one system cannot handle all this all of this kind of load there has to be multiple servers similarly imagine that you have built this analytics tool which gathers data from all the websites and shows their statistics okay even though the problem with this analytics tool is not related to storage imagine Im let, let me simplify what do you mean by analytics tool let's say you have built a counter you have built a website which does nothing but counts the number of hits okay and then if a website is getting millions of hits per second and there are thousands of such websites so you get billions of hits per second now to cater to billions of hits per second even though all they are doing is increasing a counter on your website right even though the data is very small catering to so many connections per second is really really difficult okay you cannot do it without distributing the load without involving many systems okay so the other use cases of velocity could be that we we have a live system for example lots of people are placing orders on our e-commerce website and we want to process this real-time data that and detect the fraud on our website in the real time so in the real time people are placing orders and we are doing some kind of churning of this data in real time to predict whether the user is on, on our website is using a, a you know a stolen credit card or is using their own credit card so this kind of information this kind of analytics need to be almost real time and for such kind of system you cannot get it done without having a distributed architecture okay so this is data in motion or the best example would be in the first case on facebook there's a lot of videos being uploaded facebook has to save them somewhere on the other hand every second all of us are checking our facebook status updates so the number of requests Facebook is receiving per second across the globe is really high. Okay. And that need to be catered. All right. Second is, third is variety. Variety is an interesting characteristic. And as we go into the details, we'll talk about variety a little bit more. Variety, we'll talk about two kinds of things. One, the variety of data. That need to be processed and the variety of problems that you need to solve and variety and complexities complexity of our problem statement they both lie in the same bucket
let's take a case let's take a very obvious case which we probably use at least once in a week the google maps okay the google maps i have to find the way from one place to another okay even though the maps would be small it won't go beyond few gigabytes okay and there is not much of a velocity requirement although sometimes it is but for for argument sake let's say we are just finding the the way from one location to another okay in a reasonable amount of time is okay in a reasonable amount of time say 10 seconds all right now in this case the velocity is not too high our map is not changing that fast or our request there are not many requests uh, and and the only thing is that we have to give answer in a reasonable amount of time so how do we solve such kind of problem even though data is not volume is not there velocity is not there but finding path from one place to another in a map is a complex process you will have to iteratively try all possible routes from one location to another and come up with the best one okay if you think about such kind of process it is actually quite complex okay it is actually if there are n number of circles in this map and uh, circles as in the uh, the the cross sections and there are n number of streets in this city then the total number of paths from these two place one place to another would be n into m which is very complex to iterate through so many number of ways and when the map keeps on growing bigger and bigger the pro complexity keeps on exponentially increasing and 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 these kind of problems are quite often so these kind of problems push you to convert your problem into a distributed computing problem so that many computers together can solve your problem all right so in these three cases whether volume velocity and variety by any of these virtue or more than one of these your problem could become big data problem all right so i hope it is clear now let's run through a quick exercise so how many bytes are there in a petabyte so the answer is close to 10 to the power 15 meaning close to 15 zeros those many bytes and the way you can remember is is kilo mega giga tera peta exa so when peta is basically coming after tera that means it is going to be 1024 times the tera all right so and and what is a byte byte is nothing but a bit eight no, eight bits now we know the numbers how does it feel like a petabyte if you have to just count number of vowels in one petabyte data every day can you do it do you need a distributed system or in other words is one petabyte data big data so yes one petabyte is actually a big data and in this context so whenever we talk about data you can do many things about it to the data you can just talk about it so talking about one petabyte data does not require big data system right or this counting one petabyte data across all of your users home machine does not mean you are talking about petabyte data okay what is important is that even a very simple work such as counting number of vowels is something cannot be done and you must all of you guessed it right that it's not the processor that is the bottleneck here is the limitation of the hard disk you take one terabyte of movies from your friend and you try to copy it to your your hard disk you know how much time does it take and please note the problem about moving or uh, copying the data from one hard disk to another involves writing writing is even slower so even the reading okay so let's talk about first reading 
so on an average it takes around six hours so the question here are multifold question here is first let's understand the CPU does not matter much on an average you get the CPU really really fast and as an experiment as an experiment all of you if you try to re replace your hard disk with a solid state hard drive you would notice that your computer has suddenly become really fast or you increase the RAM of your computer to something else so the CPU hardly matters in most of the computing it's generally the RAM or the hard disk which leads to sloppiness as opposed to the common belief that it is the processor okay so coming back to the point here when it takes one terabyte it takes six six hours to read one terabyte from hard disk now you can see that for one petabyte data it will take minimum of six thousand hours okay six thousand hours which is 50 days just to read one petabyte data so now another thing uh, is that this this graph basically is a, a very important graph it basically shows that around 2002 around 2002 the the digital data accumulation started increasing exponentially okay this is what it shows. so digital storage as in the data in the any digital media while the analog means storage on the paper storage on the tape types okay now why did the big data the digital storage started expanding why is it important now why does it matter to us now what has happened uh, because of which we are having a course called big data okay so first is the import the data explosion happened data explosion happened because of which the ability to store it process it fast as well as solving complex problems have come into picture and the reason are is threefold first the devices the devices if you think about devices they are data generation tools mobiles are nothing but data generation devices okay you have got these smartphones so many sensors the smartphone is having better processor than the supercomputer of 2002 okay the smartphone on which you play you play angry bird is faster than the supercomputer which was envisioned to solve the problem of the biology and the dna okay so on one hand the smartphones becomes really smart in the sense that they have so many sensors they have so many good so many high memory and 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 the processor and and the ability to store so much of data on one hand such devices became cheaper faster and smaller if you, if you go to any hardware manufacturer, they will have these three, three criteria. One is cheaper, other is faster and smaller. On one hand, the hardware kept on becoming cheaper, faster and smaller. On the other hand, the connectivity between things and the people became more and more. The connectivity in the sense, now you have 3G, 4G and Bluetooth and, and the infrared and then you have... Uh, NFC so there are so many way and Wi-Fi there are so many ways devices people and things are connected okay so so on one hand devices became really connected the connectivity problem was very well solved on the other hand the 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 devices became faster cheaper and smaller because of these two reasons more and more data kept on getting generated on the other hand these tools which let people easily share their stuff share their th stuff or share the information made the data accumulate more and increase more 
okay so so this is the reason why the data explosion happened now quick question to all of you which components impact the speed of computing cpu memory memory's read speed disk speed or disk size and the network speed okay or all of above which of these components impact the speed of computing all of these impact the speed of computing as opposed to the common belief that it's only the cpu which matters okay because of the advertisement and because of the 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 all the ad campaigns it seems to all of us that the only thing that matters in a computer is the cpu but when you see if you are running a server you will soon realize that actually the first bottleneck you will encounter is the RAM, not the CPU. CPU is probably the last bottleneck you will encounter ever. Okay, first bottleneck you will encounter is the RAM and then the disk speed and not even the disk size. And that's why if you are running a server, taking a good RAM and taking solid state hard drive makes a lot of sense. So it's generally the other things than the cpu which becomes the bottleneck okay it's only the last case which is variety variety the third third characteristic we talked about data the variety that generally leads to the cpu bottleneck all right so again let's look at the four pillars of computing I know that this is really really basic but what he found is that this kind of understanding is something has helped me a lot okay every time I look at the data I think about all these four things okay and whenever I look at the data I look at the problem I ask the question like how big is the data and what is the rate at which it's accumulating and what problem are you solving and what time are you expecting the results by or how frequently you are looking for the results all right so those are the questions and the these questions you will get more you will be able to ask better questions if you actually understand the way a computing is done Okay, my objective with all of these sessions is that you understand the basics of the things. It should get into your get into your habit uh, to understand and look at the problem from a from a distributed computing perspective. Okay, there are four things which are on which the computing stands: the CPU speed, RAM speed and size network and this size and speed on top of it there is a software okay and out of all of the things software is something which can change which you can change and make it work but that's secondary that's something we'll talk later okay let's I try to understand the hardware first so there are these four pillars on which the, the, the I mean that defines a computer although the wires that connect the CPU and the RAM, they also matter a lot. Similarly, the wires that connect the network to the, to the CPU, they also matter a lot. But these four things are the basic ones. So CPU speed, how much, how fast can it read the data uh, and process and take that call? How many instructions can it process per second? Okay, that's what, that's what CPU speed mean. Okay, second is the RAM. The RAM's speed as well as size, both the things matter a lot. So whenever you talk about RAM, you should know how fast is, how fast can you read or write? To the RAM mostly the CPU reads and writes to the RAM and every time we have a problem we generally load the data into RAM and all the algorithms you must have studied in your course almost all of them assume that the data has been loaded into the RAM 
the whole tree the tree structure link list this that almost everything is assumed to be loaded into the memory okay so all the sorting algorithms assume that the data is in the memory except for few the new ones that got introduced in last five years okay except for those the third thing is the disk speed and the size and fourth is network and network is something which we miss network is something which we miss okay so uh, let's take a case of you are running a server and the memory is going uh, overflow okay you as a programmer you will shift the bottleneck of ram to the disk now when you shift the bottleneck from the ram to the disk meaning you started uh, paging the data you if you remember the term paging paging means if you can't fit into the ram put it in the disk okay that's called paging next is when you put the put the data we start pushing the data out of the main memory and putting it into the disk then the disk read speed will become the bottleneck okay so we keep on shifting and try to shift the bottleneck from one device to another in our usual course of computing in our usual course of development or administration we try to remove the bottleneck from one place to another okay let's say we increase ram drastically our cpu might become the bottleneck so when we deal with big data any of these four components will become such a bottleneck that you cannot solve when we deal with big data at least one of these components will become such a bottleneck that you cannot solve for example see if you have a complex algorithm which is running running instructions many 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 times it might take a long long time for cpu to process so cpu might become the bottleneck if you are loading a lot of data then the ram can become the bottleneck okay so you will try to move the data from ram to somewhere else and then your disk will start becoming the bottleneck okay and if the disk speed becomes the bottleneck you can't solve it though if the disk size becomes the bottleneck you will push the data over to the network and then network speed will become the bottleneck so when we deal with big data at least one of these four components will become such a bottleneck that you cannot get over with you cannot get out of that kind of bottleneck by increasing the hardware or by increasing anything all right so at least one of these will be become bottleneck now we talked about all the problems associated we talked about why the data started expanding so much and why it's difficult to churn the data using these all systems okay the question is why do you need big data why do you need to learn any of this is there any use of big data computing okay there are usefulness which comes from big data first the first thing which is not there in the slide i would like to digress a little bit so in earlier times in in say uh, around 15 years ago when people were working on ai and machine learning the common problem was that the data was not available sufficient data was not available for machine learning to happen okay because if you have only few data points you can't plot a graph properly and you won't get the results and and that's doubly true true if you are trying to do a machine learning machine learning is teaching machine to do the from the arbitrary data to do the output okay based on the arbitrary input and output of the past it will try to predict the future okay if you have used excel and it'll try to predict what you're trying to do that's partially ex example of machine learning so earlier most of the one of the biggest problem with machine learning was that the data was not available neither the tools were available to do the computing now after after the newer tools the distributed computing came into limelight 
and proved that yes, we can handle petabytes of data, then that opened the door for for the systems like machine learning. And and that has changed the way the world works. And that has changed the way and that's continuously impacting the impacting the whole technology stack. The machine learning is is actually improving every aspect of life. Okay. All right. So let's uh, talk about example big data customers. Okay. So the first and foremost is a recommendation engine. So recommendation engine. I would like to go forward and then we'll come back. Yeah. Okay. So recommendation engine is something which was the first use case of exploiting humongous data. Okay, this is most common example of of exploiting big data to increase sales, improve user engagement, and and many more things. Okay, so there could be many different kind of recommendations. Okay, starting with people who bought this also bought this. Okay, and we are where this with that. While on the right hand side, the recommendations are very much precise and hand curated. While on the left hand side, the recommendations are automatically generated. The great part about automatic generated is that they are more precise if you have significant data. Okay, they could be really bad if the data is insignificant. All right, on the right hand side, it requires a lot of manual work to do this kind of thing, and even it is very error prone. All right. The most significant use case of recommendation was given by Netflix by giving the movie recommendation based on the past ratings. Okay, so based on your history of liking or disliking, it gives you the recommendations of which movie you might like. There are many more ways to do that, and the most common one is figuring out figuring out who are similar to you and doing the cross selling for example out of all the people who are attending the session maybe my choice is very much similar to dare or say my choices are very similar to asmeet okay maybe me and asmeet both like matrix me and asmeet both both like some other movies so our similarity is more than dissimilarities then it will start giving recommendations to me about the movies which asmeet has watched and i have not watched and similarly it will give the recommendation of my movies which asmeet has not watched and so on so basically based on so there are many more, more strategies, more, many more different kind of algorithms. I'm just describing one of such algorithm. Okay. And the be most beautiful part about recommendation is that recommendation has been solved by so many different people in so many different ways that it has become available as part of the common library called Mahat. This is a full list of algorithms which Mahat supports okay and you don't have to do any coding trust me you do not have to do any coding in order to do the do the recommendation engine we will we'll walk you through this example of generating recommendations whereby we will give Mahat three column data saying this user likes this movie and this much Imagine an Excel sheet with three columns, and that's what we will feed to Mahat. Mahat is a command, okay, which is nothing but under the hood it uses Hadoop, okay, and a couple of algorithms. So we'll tell Mahat that hey, here is my three column data in the form of CSV file, and Q 
can you give me the recommendations and Mahath will give me again three column data with the recommendation that this user would like this movie and this much it's the, my hypothesis Mahath's it's Mahath's hypothesis saying that this user will like this movie this much okay or they will rate this movie this much the second problem which is very well solved with big data is sentiment analysis instead of instead of gathering surveys the way the way people people earlier tried to figure out how good is the movie okay they what they used to do is just outside the movie movie hall movie cinema theater the, there will be some people who will be asking questions okay to the various people collect, collecting the data set or doing the survey gathering the survey results and then and then uh, based on a statistical analysis we could come up with a with the idea whether people are liking this movie or not but that was too much time consuming and full of different kind of biases so instead of asking people this way you could just go through the social feed okay you could just go through the social feed and see how many people are liking a movie how many people are talking about it what are, are they using negative words with movie or positive words with movie and accordingly accordingly by understanding the text you will come to the conclusion that these many people or these many tweets are there which like this particular movie and these many tweets are there which do not like this kind of movie so we will go through a Twitter Twitter uh, use case whereby we'll do the sentiment analysis in the last session all right so these are the two main problems for which big data is used next is so we talked about recommendation engine second is the search quality okay so sometimes a lot of times search to improve search quality you need to process a huge data okay with respect to the search quality let's say you're building a small search engine for your corporate network now you would like to improve the quality such that if a user is typing a word you are able to give the recommendation also you are able to figure out that what are the different what are the different meanings of the same word to do so you would need a big dictionary and that kind of dictionary you need to prepare by crawling a lot of data and that lot of data is big data okay third is sentiment analysis which we have already discussed and fourth is a b testing okay if you if you have heard about this term you must have heard it in terms of the medical ones so before a drug is given and approved before a drug is approved the drug is given to a small sample set of people okay who enroll for testing for the drug now so similarly there is one sample set to who the drug is given and there is another sample set to who the drug is not given with the similar symptoms now you observe both sets of people and then see the effect of drug see their behavior with and without the drug and then you reach to the conclusion that whether drug is impactful or not okay so this is called a b testing you have a and you have b you have two sets a and b a is somebody with the treatment to who you have given the treatment and b is the other test the, the other set who has not been given the the treatment okay and then we compare whether giving the drug solved the problem or the problem got solved automatically so this is called a b testing and a b testing is a very important thing in case of IT industry so for K in for the case of Amazon the so since I was in the detail phase for me a B testing mattered a lot 
we whenever there is a new feature that comes up it's given to only 1% of the user randomly selected so different users actually see different page based on this random selection and then we observe that which one gave us better sales whether the blue button is giving us more sales or the green buy now button is giving more sales and accordingly we decide whether a particular particular color is good or not all right so th these are the impacts of a b testing in telecommunication the impact of big data is huge it is used for customer churn prevention by figuring out why are the customers leaving you by understanding how many calls they gave before they decided to pull the card okay similarly how many times their network was out of coverage area and so so by understanding the user's behavior you can actually predict why are people leaving us okay why are my our customers leaving us and the and and how can we prevent them second is the network performance optimization okay so based on the past behavior of the users the telecom telecoms can predict what is going to be the load tomorrow okay third is cdr analysis doing the calling record data analysis for various kinds of reasons fourth is analyzing network predict failure okay so you can you can based on the past history of the data you can see that okay this kind of fluctuation in the signal it generally because of the failure and because of the failure being starting and hence it could lead to severe failure so you can predict that failure based on the past history government uses big data as in the huge data for doing the fraud detection cyber security welfare and the justice and for healthcare and life sciences uses because in healthcare everything is big same is the case with government so in healthcare the health information exchange to gene sequencing to healthcare improvement and drug safety everything is a big data problem so these are the 11 common myths about big data it's always about above or range of the terabytes not necessarily sometimes few gigabytes also become big data because of the last thing which is called variety okay second is is it always about social media and doesn't apply to me it's just it just so happens that gathering social media's data is the easiest thing to do and therefore in lots of use cases or example use cases of big data you will find you will find the social media data but that does not mean it's limited to the social media there could be many many more use cases it will replace enterprise data warehousing no okay enterprise data warehousing is good only is good for the relational data transactional data and most of the big data tools since being in the distributed nature they are not great with the enterprise data warehouse okay so the next is the is it just a buzzword no practical application no has it been just a buzzword it would have died by now okay there are many more companies utilizing it and i have seen a lot of organizations starting with amazon itself everything seems to be a big data problem okay is is a new concept no it has been there for quite some time will be the future no it's a present all right is expensive no the all of the solutions are open source it is just since because of the people the demand of the people and the supply is there's a difference and therefore people are little expensive otherwise the technology is really cheap it is only for data scientist or is a magic no 
good the beautiful part about the current world where we are living is that most of the great algorithms are open and free okay the data scientists when they work on it and most of them make their algorithms public and free similarly you always have access to humongous data which you can churn okay the other excuse i hear is from the people who don't understand big data they think that it's all about buying new hardware no the whole premise of big data is that whatever hardware you have we will connect it over a distributed computing and we will start using it you don't have to buy a high end server you don't have to buy another blade servers with 80 gb ram no average computers could be used all right we will build it when we need it okay so this is another excuse i hear that we will build it when we need it my quick answer to them is when you need it you won't have it because that you won't have the data by that time okay so the general strategy is to build the infrastructure let the data accumulate and then you can think later what all can you automate what all can you analyze okay next is the big data is about hadoop no hadoop is just one such solution here is a general trend and in this general trend you can see that hadoop is probably the the highest in the salary trend all right because there was no way to figure out big data so i've just picked hadoop all right so there are many big data solutions starting with hadoop spark cassandra mongodb google computing every one of these have their benefits and downsides so if you just if you are open to giving away your data to google engine you can use google compute engine okay if you are okay okay to upload the data there okay google provides you a good query language on top of data and some algorithms okay if you just are looking for looking for storing data in the form of json object you could use mongodb but it will be difficult for you to apply various kinds of distributed algorithms next is cassandra if you have data which is in tabular format and is humongous you could use cassandra all right but again for the computing you will have to uh, there will be the computing won't be that fast on cassandra okay next comes a combination of spark and hadoop it's a combination of spark and hadoop this is probably the most extensive architecture and is probably the best to have in your cl cluster a combination of hadoop and spark all right so what exactly is hadoop all right so let's understand what do we mean by hadoop okay so hadoop is a software which was written based on google file system google map reduce and google big table so as i was telling you google published these three papers sanjay gemawat and jeff dean they they, they published these three papers one was called google file system other was called google map reduce computation something massive parallel something and third one was the big table based on these three doc cutting and mike caffarella built hadoop and why did they build they were basically trying to build a search engine called nutch they were trying to build this search engine and they were stuck at a point that where they realized that even if we build this kind of search engine we won't be able to store the data okay they did not have a great solution and they were lucky at that point of time when they were stuck at this point they were lucky to see that the google had google had just published some paper and and they took it and implemented the file system and that's what became hadoop okay and it was named after toy elephant with which doc cutting sun was playing and it is open source this is probably one of the reasons why hadoop exists there are many there, there were many other people who were doing non open source and were trying to implement the same paper 
but they did not get anywhere the reason is that if you are not open source your adoption chances are going to be very low so since hadoop was open source that too it was apache license that gave them a great acceptance in the industry okay it's a framework to handle big data and it's for reliable scalable and distributed computing okay so this is the the line number h is something what defines all the components under hadoop so initially hadoop was only three components and slowly slowly hadoop became an umbrella term okay as of now hadoop the ecosystem includes around 13 13 14 components okay so all of those components which are under the umbrella of hadoop has these three characteristics reliable scalable and distributed and it was written in java so that it can run on any device okay so in the whole ecosystem of hadoop the one that's at the bottom the one that's most important is hdfs okay hdfs is most important component of hadoop ecosystem because this is the place from where the whole uh, magic starts what is hdfs it's a file system the way you have your c colon which is a file system provided by windows to you it's a ntfs file system or vfat file system in the same way you have another file system called hdfs this hdfs can store humongous data and is heavily heavily uh, distributed so you the the hdfs as opposed to your local file system what is a file system it has folders and files okay you can keep anything inside a file okay here that's why a file system is very important it's a place where anybody can put any kind of data unlike a database where you could only put the data in a certain structure here you can put data of any structure so hdfs is the the, the first thing an hdfs runs on top of the whole cluster okay so many computers contribute to the storage in hdfs and is heavily heavily optimized and is very highly available in case one computer goes down there is somebody else and that model is something very very powerful there is no substitute as of now a good substitute as of now for hdfs okay as the in hdfs you can store any data while if you take mongodb cassandra or or hbase or any other place you'll have to store the data either in a tabular format or in a json format or in some other format not like a file while hdfs provides you that file kind of storage all right the next component is hbase hbase is a nosql data store a common question which people ask is why would you use hbase when you have hdfs reason is in hbase you store data in a tabular format and not everything can fit into tabular you want to store image you want to store something else you would like to store in hdfs instead of in a tabular structure all right now the next component after HD, hdfs and hbase is the compute engine the storage the file system is providing you the place to put your files and these files are spread across the cluster okay now but but let's say you want to do some computation who will do that who will execute your logic on many computers parallelly and that's where yarn comes into play or MapReduce comes into play so the computation is done by either MapReduce or spark 
on and they both run on top of yarn then what is yarn yarn is somebody like a bookkeeper who keeps track of who keeps track of which notes are free which notes are busy which which ones have what kind of capability so yarn makes it possible to execute anything on any node at any point of time okay yarn can tell you that this these nodes are free you can use them so yarn makes it possible for many other systems to use the cluster okay and the consumers of yarn are mapreduce spark and others so spark also asks yarn to do the things for it and you as a user of MapReduce uh, spark you will ask MapReduce or spark to get the work done on top of yarn okay and yarn will execute your logic on the cluster or on the distributed environment maybe you have 20 computers and out of those 20 there are two computers which are very fast and rest of the computers are very slow this yarn will figure that out and will execute your logic on those nodes all right so that's about the compute engine now with MapReduce for the computation it was every time you have to do something you would end up writing java code which was not acceptable and which is not really practical so some people came up with the idea saying that let's write a sql engine and this this sql engine is called hive it takes sql from you understands the sql and convert the sql into MapReduce. all right that's where the hive comes into play all right i'll come to flume and scoop later all right next similar to hive some people realize that sql is not doing justice to the new paradigm so they wrote a language which is you can say a simplified sql okay very simplified sql called pig, pig latin it is for just like sql is used to analyze data similarly pig latin is also used for analyzing data all right now there is something called machine learning if this is the magician with you machine learning library called mahat comes up with a collection of algorithms such as generating recommendation or doing the clustering or we will talk, we'll talk about all of these in details so that's about that's about it okay go through the cloud labs here are the links when you log in into my course you will see all these details so you log in into your account and use these links instead of these links so i'll just take you through this so when you log in you will see ambari hue and web console ambari means the administrative console where you can see how many so you could go to dashboard it shows that this is the total sdfs storage okay we'll talk about what does it mean it shows that uh, resource manager heap is 8% used so it's basically showing you the aggregate details and then under hosts you can see that there are five hosts as of now so this is administrative console but if you go into this is the terminal where you can type commands it's a full fledged unix terminal it's not paralyzed you can see that you can even run things like python and things like r okay from the same terminal you can actually use all these commands all right so next is hue using hue you can interact with almost every tool you have you can talk to hbase you can talk to zookeeper you can talk to scoop you can talk to hive meta tables and you can create the uzi workflows and so on okay you can see you can interact with hive impala db query pig job designer spark all right so that's pretty much okay 
so go through cloud labs understand uh, go through lms and if you want to set up your hadoop environment the details are also provided in lms session one okay you can attend to the half quiz from first session